Let's Brother Bill, you come. Thank you very much, Pastor. Take your Bibles and join me in turning to Joshua chapter number 4 this morning. Joshua chapter number 4. And it's a delight to uh, be a part of this service. When Pastor had asked me about uh, the opportunity to... uh, He said, you know, would you be able to come? And initially I wasn't sure. Uh, Part of that is, is this afternoon, later in the afternoon, my oldest son is getting married. And so uh, I wasn't sure. You're like, well... Shouldn't you be with your son this morning? He's a sheriff's deputy, and he had to work all night last night, so he uh, is probably getting ready for the uh, wedding uh, this afternoon, so he's dead to the world trying to sleep uh, with uh, his typical schedule, so I'll see him this afternoon, but uh, once I realized that all my family obligations weren't until the middle of the afternoon, I said, boy, I would love to, and uh, my wife and I, we actually, I remember one time we went visiting uh, for the church early on in the, uh, in, the, in the early stages. We came over one day. I'll never forget it. Um, I, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you the area, but I could certainly tell you about one particular visit. It was in a rural part of Polk County. And uh, we turned in this driveway. Uh, you couldn't see the house from the road. And uh, eventually the road turned from gravel to Carolina red dirt. And uh, after what seemed like an eternity, we, ar- we arrived at a house. And you know, when you see three dogs sleeping under the porch, a couple of men in bib overalls with that look of what are you doing here, uh, I-, I remember just digging deep into my North Carolina roots and I said, I've got to get myself out of this one. And uh, walked up there and uh, they didn't know who we were. I told them about the church and gave them the invitation, but they, they said, you can be on your way now because I'm sure there are a lot of things that happen on that property that they didn't want anybody to know about. But uh, uh, I remember that very distinctly, and uh, I'm so thankful for uh, what God has done through the years. I remember when Brother Dietrich came and uh, told me that uh, he was going to be leaving the college to, teach, or to, to pastor here, and I was upset. Uh, But I wasn't upset at him. I was upset because sometimes my will is not God's will. And uh, and I did. As I wrestled with that, I just thought, you know, Lord, this this makes perfect sense to me. I don't know why, uh, you know, this, this, but to me it's so obvious to see the changed lives, to see what God is doing out here. I'm so grateful he came to me that day and he told me this is what the Lord Uh, wants me to do and I've had a joy I've seen it from afar I've been able to come from time to time to minister and uh, to see so many faces today listen I'm glad uh, that you're able to celebrate celebrate this anniversary Uh, I think it's important to celebrate anniversaries husbands do you believe it's important to celebrate anniversaries Uh, I learned very quickly after being raised in a household that didn't celebrate birthdays and anniversaries when I got married my wife schooled me in that. She said, anniversaries are important. And uh, I did. I changed my tune in that. And I, I believe that. And I think anniversaries in a church uh, are important. And I was blessed to sit in Sunday school and uh, hear a little bit of just the rehearsal of what God has done through the years. So I pray that the Lord will use the message this morning uh, to help us on this occasion. Joshua chapter 4, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. Joshua chapter 4 and verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying... Now, I I might add this. Uh, I'm thankful for my deep North Carolina roots because it sometimes helps me understand the Bible more. And the reason I tell you that is when it says when all the people were clean passed over... As a kid, I understood what that meant. Uh, when somebody would say, that, that, just, that just, just clean messed them up. I knew what that meant. That meant it completely messed them up. That's what that word meant. So those of you who are Southerners and you have, from North Carolina, uh, you've been schooled in the King's English more than you think, all right? So there's something good about that, Brother Kurt. So when I read that, I had no problem understanding it at all. So when they had completely passed over Jordan, verse 2, he said, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, 
Out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Now I want you to jump ahead now to, with verse, to verse 15. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan. And Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up into dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned to their place and flowed over his banks as they did before. And all the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day, the first month, and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in times to come, saying, What mean ye these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you as you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. This morning I want to preach to you a message that I have entitled The Story of the Stones. Israel has just crossed over Jordan and now they're commanded to set a pile of stones, 12 stones, one for each tribe, as memorial, as a reminder. You know, thousands of years later we have lost, I think, some of the significance of this event that took place. When we see a pile of stones today, that can mean just about anything. Uh, I remember several years ago, my son Andrew, who's getting married today, we traveled to Las Vegas for a revival meeting where we would be with Dr. Comfort. I would be leading the music, preaching in the Christian school, Brother Comfort preaching each night. And I remember one afternoon the pastor came to us and he said, you know, let's go out for a long drive outside of the city and I want to show you the outside of Las Vegas. We said, sure, that'd be nice. And so the pastor and his wife took us on a drive. And I'm telling you, you talk about people living off the grid. You get about an hour away from Las Vegas and there are people that don't want anybody in the world to know they're there. And they're truly living off the grid. And I remember as we were driving back that afternoon, the pastor looked and he said, you see that bluff right there? He said, how about if we pull over on the side of the road and you and your son run up to the top of that, that, that hill, that bluff there, and he said, and we'll snap a picture of you. And I thought, well, that, that would be nice. And so Andrew at the time, he's in his mid-teens at the, at, at the most at that point. And so they pulled over on the side of the road. Andrew and I run into this barren part of the desert, wilderness, whatever you want to call it. And we make our trek up that mountain and we're just running, we're running, we're running. And finally, I just wanted to slow down a little bit. We were getting to the top. And Andrew said, Dad, come here. And I mean in the middle of nowhere, we saw this pile of rocks. Andrew said, Dad, what is this? I said, I don't know. And Andrew takes his foot and he kicks over this pile of rocks. And lo and behold... Uh, in the pile of rocks, I looked down, there was a plastic Ziploc bag. And in it, it had a medicine bottle. And then it had a note, note that had a phone number, and it had a Danish coin, a coin from Denmark that had a hole in it. It's called a kroner. And it was paper clipped to it. And Andrew picks it up, and he begins to look at it, and he reads it, and he's like, Dad, I don't think, I think these people are up to no good. And I did something at that point. I really questioned the wisdom of it. I said, well, you know what? If it's something that's no good, maybe we should just take it. <laughs> and, 
So we went to the top of the bluff. We had our picture taken, waved at the pastor, and down we come with this plastic bag of a medicine bottle that has who knows what in it at this moment. And we go back down and we tell the pastor what we found. Well, the pastor told us, he said, hey, he said, out here sometimes these people that do these drug deals, they leave their stuff out in the middle of a, of, of a desolate place where you have to find it with a GPS. And he said, that's how, he said, let's take that back to the church. We have a police officer in our church. And he said, he'll take care of that. And I thought, well, you know, the pastor said so. That'd be a great idea. And so here we are. We're riding down the road carrying a substance that we don't know. And I am so glad that nobody stopped us to say, what is that? And we're like, we don't know. We found this out in the middle of nowhere. And they'd say, yeah, right. That's what they all say. <laughs> and I do. I remember that night. We got to the service early. The police... A uh, police uh, member of the church who was a police officer met us and he looked at it and he said, lo and behold, he opened it and it was, a, it was something that was illegal. He just threw it out in the parking lot and stomped it into the asphalt and he flipped the coin to my son and he said, here's you a souvenir for Las Vegas. You can have it. And I think to this day, my son still has the coin that was found. But, you know, thousands of years later, you see a pile of rocks and really it doesn't carry it may be a great significance. But I want you to understand that this pile of rocks was not just an ordinary pile of rocks. God commanded Israel to take these stones and to set them in a pile and he wanted to remind them of one of the greatest acts of deliverance that they would ever experience. And when I see God's command to Israel many years ago, I'm reminded of this, that God commands the believer, God commands us to remember his mighty works. And that's one of the reasons we're meeting together today. God has commanded us to remember, not to live in the past, but to inspire us to go forward in the future. And I want you to take a few moments today. And for those of you who have been here a long time, I think it's good for you to remember. And for those of you who are new on the scene, it's good for you to listen because I'm telling you, God is still doing mighty things. But God commanded the nation of Israel to remember His mighty works and God commands us to do the same. I believe that Israel, here they come over the Jordan River. And the Bible tells us that they pass over in dry land the very moment that the ark is lifted and they leave that river, it flows and it returns to its normal flow. And it's after that God says, I want you to pile up these stones and I want you to remember what I've done. Now there's three things that I want to show you this morning as we consider the story of the stones. Number one, I want you to see the memory behind the stones. These stones, they represent something. What do they represent? And that's found later on in our text. Whenever in verse 21, the Bible says, when children ask their fathers, what mean ye these stones? What are these stones about? Then, then God tells them in verse 22, then shall you let your children know Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. Now, just for a few moments, I want you to take your familiarity with the story and cast it to the wind. Or otherwise, you read it, you shrug your shoulders, and you say, so what? We know this. Yes, they went over Jordan. I'm very familiar with that story. Let me tell you, part of this memory is just flat out, can I tell you, miraculous. It's a shame when we read the supernatural in the Bible and shrug our shoulders as if it's old news, old hat. Do you understand what has just happened? I don't know what the local river is, but back from where I was raised near Yadkinville, North Carolina, uh, the Yadkin River. Anytime I pass the Yadkin River on I-40 or I-77, I have a moment of silence because I'm either leaving or entering the promised land. 
but it would be just like going to your average river and all of a sudden it just drying up. Listen, that just doesn't normally happen. It doesn't, that, that is a supernatural feat. If, if I could say it was miraculous, sometimes I believe the word miraculous is overused and other times I believe it's underrated. You know, sometimes we use the word miraculous about everything when really the effort of man could have accomplished that. And then there's times where we, we should probably use the word miraculous. We can't see what is before us. Can I tell you, just as God dried up the Jordan River, that was a miraculous event. I believe with all of my heart that one of the reasons you're here is because God has done the impossible. It's miraculous. And you know what? God wants us to remember the miraculous. But not only was this memory miraculous, but now I've done something here that I probably shouldn't do. You shouldn't use a part of the word. You know, when you have a definition, you don't use a part of the word in the definition. But here in this memory behind the stones, not only is it miraculous, but it is memorable. I mean, it stands out in your mind. If you're an Israelite, listen, this did not happen every day. It was a memory. It was something that was very, very memorable. Can I tell you that I think in the life of every believer, you know, there ought to be occasions where you look back and those are just special memories. Amen. It's not every day that God dries up the Jordan River. Let me tell you, it's not every day that God transformed your life like He did the day you got saved either. Amen. You know, there's some memories that I don't like, but there's some memories that I really do, and that's one of them. When I can look back and how as a 12-year-old boy, God reached down in the foothills of North Carolina and when nobody else may have known who I was, God had a divine love and concern for me and that day He reached down and He saved me. Amen. But you know, I'm afraid that there are a lot of people, they go through life, there's no real memories when it comes to God. Look back in your life. Tell me the times and the moments where God touched your life and changed you. I realize that for every believer, it ought to be every day that God is changing us. But can I tell you, there's been times in my life where I mean God did something in, a, in just a special way that I'll never forget. I can't tell you the exact day that I got saved. I can tell you the approximate time of day. I can't tell you all of the details, but I can tell you this. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was on that Sunday afternoon as a 12-year-old boy that God saved me and I received His forgiveness and my life was forever changed. Amen. I can tell you later on, as struggling as a teenager, another pile of rocks for me was when I realized that I had one part of me that wanted to live one way and another part that wanted to do right, and it was just a struggle. Every time I bounced back and forth between the public school and church, it was like being torn apart. But yet there finally came a day when God, through a series of events, broke my heart, and I realized, you know what, I think it's just probably best at this point to sell out lock, stock, and barrel. And on a, sat on a, on a Thursday night... I told the Lord, I said, God, I cannot live this way the rest of my life. I think I just need to find out what you want me to do and do it. One memory that was sort of bittersweet was whenever I was in college and I was a freshman, I was sitting on my bed. I had a lower bunk as a freshman. That's rare. Usually you're relegated to the heavenlies when you're a freshman. You have no standing. You have no rank. But I remember sitting in my bed as a freshman and God was working in my heart. Why? Because I was pretending to be one thing before people and God knew exactly what I was and God convicted my heart. And while that was a bittersweet moment and it was painful for me to admit where I was at, can I tell you the results were glorious. I look back and that was a pile of rocks that, changed, that, that symbolized a moment that changed my life. Hey, I want to ask you, what memories do you have of God working in your life? Where are your pile of rocks this morning? You see, this story of the stones, the memory behind it, it's miraculous. God did something that man could not do. God did something that was memorable, that made an impression. And God did something that was very meaningful. Why? Because at this point... Israel is stepping over to enter into a whole new phase of history like they've never experienced. 
So what memorable and meaningful things has God done in your life? I hope today that you recognize that as a church. But listen to me, if you walk out of here and you understand the history of the church, but yet God hasn't meaningfully moved in your own life, that's of the greatest importance right now for you to understand. So the first thing we see is the memory behind the stones. The Jordan River dries up. But now I want you to see the location of these stones, and that's Gilgal. You know, many of you, you're like, well, I'm not big into Bible towns and Bible cities. Well, you might know more about it than you think. You ever heard of Bethlehem? You at least hear that every December, right? Well, that was a pretty important place. That was prophesied where Jesus would be born. You ever heard the name Jerusalem? That's a pretty important place. Jesus would be delivered there to be crucified. And one day you're going to see the new Jerusalem, so it would be good for you to know a little bit about it. You may not know a whole lot about Gilgal, and I'm not here to give you a history lesson, but I'll tell you in Joshua chapter 4 and Joshua chapter 5, you'll learn a lot about Gilgal just in reading those two chapters. Let me give you four things about the location of these stones that I think are of great importance. Number one is that Gilgal was a place of beginnings. Why? Because this is the first place where Israel, after they cross Jordan, they encamp in Canaanite territory. Now, you've got to understand a little bit about the history. God is calling Israel to cross Jordan, and now they're going into land that is not conquered, that is unknown to them, but God has promised them, I will give it to you. You know, to me, I sort of, my, my parents were very overprotective. I remember the first time they let me stay overnight somewhere besides home. Man, I, I'll tell you, I was like, wow, this is incredible. This is great. But can I tell you, God at this moment, He lets Israel, Israel crosses Jordan, and now this is, this is really where the beginning of going forth after Jordan, this is where it's taken place. It's a bunch of unknowns. You remember when those spies got together, there were 10 of them that were good and two, or 10 of them that were bad, two were good. There were, I think all of them were like, boy, I mean the inhabitants of the land, they're like giants. They could squash us. I think all of them knew that, that the Canaanites could just destroy them, but there were two of them that were persuaded that we're well able to overtake them. And now the moment has come in the spirit of those two spies who said we're well... Yes, they're bigger than us, but that's okay. God told us it's ours, so that's all that matters. And now the spirit of those two spies have carried them across Jordan and they're in a place of beginnings. What was it, 11th anniversary? Oh, you still got a lot of new on this church. There's still a lot of conquered territory that needs to be taken. There's still a lot of Polk County that needs to be reached. <laughs> I don't think you're an old fogey by any means. I, I think you're just, you've just crossed over a little ways and there's still a lot of work to be done. But not only was Gilgal a place of beginning, but Gilgal was also a place of total sanctification. I won't take the time to read it to you, but in, in Joshua chapter 5, the Israelites who were born in the wilderness, during those wilderness wanderings, they are circumcised in chapter 5. And while many of the Israelites had already obeyed in God's command, now we find that those that were in the wilderness, those who were born in the wilderness, those who come out of Egypt... They experience the ritual or the whatever you want to call it of circumcision as this identification is made. Now all of Israel is being is shown before the world as being set apart. That's a great way to start. If you're going to conquer the land and you're going to go and be amongst the midst of God's enemies, at least let it be said whose side you were on. Amen. 
You know, sanctification, it's the idea of being set apart. This is an identification. It's going, they're going to say, wow, you know, they have followed God in this matter of circumcision, so therefore here they are. They are sanctified. They are set apart from the Egyptians. They're set apart from the world. This place is very, very important because I believe that for the greatest work to be done uh, through your life, you have to be given to total sanctification. You have to be willing to identify with the Lord no matter the cost, no matter the pain, no matter the inconvenience. You know, there are some of you here and you can talk about instances where you've seen in the lives of your family. You'd say, you know what, I remember, yeah, we, we talked about how God did this and God did that. I'm telling you, people have seen a lot of piles of rocks, but the greater question I ask you is, are you personally totally sanctified and set apart for the work of the Lord? It's one thing to look at a pile of rocks, but it's another thing to be sold out in your heart. Total sanctification. How does the work, how does the work of Crossroads Baptist Church go forward? How does the work of the Lord go forward when God's people unashamedly are willing to identify with Him no matter the cost? Gilgal's a place of total sanctification. But Gilgal was also, interestingly enough, a place of worship. When you look a little later in Joshua chapter 5. In verse number 10, it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, even in the plains of Jericho. You want to talk about the Passover. Do you remember the origins of the Passover? Oh, it's about 40 years prior. You remember God was working on Pharaoh? to get Israel out of there. And it took 10 rounds. Some of you are like, well, I'm stubborn. Pharaoh was stubborn 10 times over and then even after the 10th time he decided to change his mind. If there's some of you here and you're like, yeah, I know God's trying to get my attention and I know that I should, but you know, I'm just stubborn. Listen to me. Read the Old Testament and see how many times God rung Pharaoh's bell and are you going to choose to be that stubborn? But in that final plague, we talk about a passing over where God passed over the households of all those that had the blood on the, door, on the doorpost. However, Pharaoh did not and his firstborn child died. The death angel passed over everybody else except for those that had disobeyed. And then after that, you have this concept called the Passover. We really don't have an appreciation for it like the Jews did of that day, but I'm telling you, they were celebrating. Here, God was actively working in their midst, and they are going to be delivered out of Egypt. And it was that great act that day that God would use as a picture so many years forward. But I'm telling you, when Israel got to Gilgal, you know what they did? They observed the Passover. They worshiped God. Gilgal was a place of worship. You know, here's a place that God has raised up where we corporately worship Him. We ought to come together and we ought to remember God's great things. And as a result, it ought to cause us... The meaning of the word worship means to bow down. It means to submit. You know, when you come together on a day like this and you say, My, look at what God's done. You know what it ought to drive us to? It ought to drive us to our knees. For us to understand that the same submission that got us to this point is the same submission that will get us to the next one. To worship God. Worship's a very confusing word in Christianity today. So often churches today have substituted the word worship with entertainment. And what you win people with is what you have to keep them with. You always have to do bigger and you always have to do better. But let it be said that when people come to a place like Crossroads Baptist Church, that this is a place, you know what, where we know and where we, we are able to worship God. I'm talking about leaving the church property knowing that you heard from heaven. 
I'm talking about leaving this place and knowing that you have obeyed the Lord and you've submitted to Him. It's a place of beginning. It's a place of total sanctification. It's a place of worship. But let me tell you one other thing about Gilgal, the placement of these rocks, that it was a place of reassurance. I want you to notice with me in verse 13 of chapter 5. Look at this. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Now, in a few moments when we read the other verses, you're going to find that this is an appearance of the Lord to Joshua. And some of us, a few thousand years later, we look at Joshua and we find fault and say, Well, man alive, why couldn't you just identify this was the Lord to start with? Well, before, let me pull you down off your high horse for just a moment. Joshua is an uncharted territory. He knows there's giants in the land. He saw them earlier. He knows that there is work to be done. And now he sees somebody with a sword drawn in front of him. If you went outside, I know now it's not swords, it's guns. But usually when you see somebody with a weapon, does, do you immediately think they're for you? I'll tell you, I get in enough churches... Sometimes I'm not worried about somebody coming in and shooting the church, up the church. I'm worried about the crossfire because there's so many people that are carrying. Like if I just get behind this piece of wood, I'll be safe. You know why you're carrying? Listen, if you walk and you see somebody with a weapon, you're not, oh, well, they must be for us. Don't be too hard on Joshua. I mean, his heightness here, he's alerted and he looks and he sees this man with a sword drawn. He says, are you for us? Are you for our adversaries? And notice verse 14. And he said, nay, no. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face unto earth and he did worship. And he said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. <laughs> you know what I believe God did that day? Hey, they just crossed Jordan. They had just gone over into unfamiliar territory. The Lord maybe scares Joshua to death, but before it's over with, Joshua is reassured he's in the right place. You know, I like it when the Lord tells me something the first time, but also like it when He tells me the second time. And there are times in our spirit where we need reassurance. There are times you move into a new property. There's times that you move into a new building. And there are times where you work in heart spots with people where lives need to be changed and you don't know what to do. But every once in a while, the Lord can come along and He just reassures you. I like Gilgal. It may demand total sanctification, but if I can hear the Lord's reassurances along the way, that's all right. It's a good place to be. The memory behind the stones, the location of the stones, and the last thing I want to tell you is the purpose of the stones. Growing up, my mom, maybe she wanted to be complimentary to somebody, she'd say, boy, those sure are pretty. Not P-R-E-T-T-Y, but P-U-R-T-Y, pretty. I want you to know when you see this pile of stones in Gilgal, it's not just some perfectly laid masterpiece. No, there's a meaning behind it. There's a purpose for those stones, and that purpose is found in verse 24 of chapter 4. Why did God tell them to put those stones there? That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. You saw it on a presentation before the service, but I'll just reiterate it this way, God's glory. You see this place, you don't see a man. You don't see a group of people. Ultimately, you see the Lord. 
God uses people and He has used them and He will continue to. But ultimately, listen, what's happening here, all of Polk County ought to see it and say, you know what, something different is happening there, something strange, something good is happening, and they give God the glory even though they may not even know it. What's different about those people? What's different about that place? I'll tell you what it is. It's God. You know, there have been so many people through the years that have, I don't care if it's contractors, architects, uh, city officials. You know what? They've seen this thing enough from a distance. And you know, when they see these things, they, leave, they can leave with a sense, you know what? God did that because I don't know how it happened. 125 gallons a minute. Is that what you said, Pastor Dietrich? I don't know what our well was back home, but that's pretty impressive when you mention these other things. I can't help but think somebody in the county just walks away shaking their head saying, man, that's the most I've ever seen in a while on a lot like that. You know what that is? That's God's glory. <laughs> Nobody can say, well, Ron Capel told him where to dig. No, he didn't know where to dig, and if you gave him a shovel, he wouldn't have known where to dig. No offense, Brother Capel, but we're in the same boat. We're not well diggers, me and you. But that's what, what, what all of this that's been going on, what happens? It points to God. It is pointing a group of people in the county to God. And it doesn't hurt you to take some time and to remember what God has done. Why? Because, listen, God is getting glory from it. But notice the last part of the verse that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. You see, this wasn't just for God's glory, but it was for their good. You say, I don't see the word good in there. You know, the fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is good. But I want you to notice something. That very last two words, it says... Forever. You know what? A pile of rocks eventually. I'm going to Israel next Mar next May. I, I doubt I find this pile of rocks. But I want you to see that the legacy of these stones, it wasn't just a matter of seeing a pile of rocks, but it was something that would have an enduring impact on the lives of these people. The greatest thing about the memorial is not the memorial itself. It's the effect that it has on people forever. There's some of you in this room, you've seen God do a lot. You know what? The Lord wants the fear of the Lord to endure in your heart forever. The rest of your life. The same awe that you look and say, man, I cannot believe that God did this and God did that. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to serve the Lord. God wants that to perpetu be perpetual in your life and it drive you to a life of holiness and a life of serving God. That's the purpose. And as pastor so well said at the end of Sunday school hour, you know, it's easy to rest on your laurels and it's easy for you to say, well, boy, look at what all God has done. And you ought to do that to an extent. But I'm going to tell you, for Joshua, there was an entire land to be conquered. You let that pile of rocks drive you on. The same faith that got you across the Red Sea and the same faith that got you across Jordan is the same God that's going to help you reach Polk County. On a day like this, it's good to see a pile of stones. It's good when God moves mightily in your life to just set up those little pile of rocks and say, you know what, I don't want to ever forget that. And I hope you make that a practice in your life. I think it's a biblical one. If it's not with a pile of rocks, it's at least it's in your mind. You say, I'll never forget that. I hate to use this closing illustration because it deals with money. And, uh, but yet it's one, of the most, it's one of the most vivid ways that I've ever seen God work. And I tried to exercise this principle. I remember when I became the president of Ambassador, uh, I knew as we planned for the future, I said, Lord, I really love for us to get out of debt. I, I knew that uh, I didn't feel that our indebtedness was reckless 
at all. It was manageable. It was uh, one of those things, but it was just always, just, uh, just always in the back of your mind, what could we do if we could just get out from under this? And uh, it was really a burden for me. Brother Comfort had stepped down, and I said, boy, it'd be great if in his lifetime he could just see this thing done with. And uh, so I just we'd pray in our faculty prayer meetings. I said, Lord, I, I really love for you to see you do this, and there's things that we could do, and I think in planning for the future for our students and trying to help them, it gets us on our way. But, Lord, you're going to have to do it. It was just under a million dollars. And uh, you just pray and you just go on. And we kept praying and praying. And I remember I was down in Florida with the ensemble. Uh, we were down in a church. I'll never forget this particular service for several reasons. One is at the end of the service, the pastor was just so moved by the service with the kids singing and, and the preaching and all that. He said, you know what? He said, I really think that uh, you know, whatever's given in the offering tonight for the college at the church ought to double it. And uh, church folks agreed to it. And uh, afterwards, the pastor came to me and handed me a check for $10,000. The offering was $2,500. Another person in the church wanted to match the $2,500 to make the church give another $5,000. But you know what? In the service that night, there was a lady who called me. She was in her 80s. Her name was Mildred Thorson. And... Uh, Mrs. Thorson called me and she said, you know, it was just such a blessing to see these young kids that want to serve the Lord. And she said, you know, I want to give a gift to the college. And she did. And a lady who had didn't marry until she was 70 years old. She had served in children's ministries all of her lives until she met a guy when she was 70 as she moved to Florida. And then apparently they were married for about 20 years and he had passed away. Well, in one of those conversations with Mrs. Thorson, she told me, she said, you know, she said, I really would like to help the school one day, maybe leaving the school in my will. And I said, ma'am, you just, whatever you think, and I'll be honest, when people start talking about that, it gets awkward in a hurry, and, you know, you don't talk with anticipation. I, I was just like, ma'am, you just do whatever the Lord wants you to do. And the truth is, I just sort of threw that out of my mind and didn't really even think about it. A few years later, she passed away, and she was well in her 90s at this point. And uh, here was a lady who had, I mean, served in children's ministries. She was just a servant of the Lord uh, through the years in her local church. Long story short, there was over half a million dollars that was left to the college. And that was a very humbling thing. I'll never forget it. I was in Arizona. I was at a camp. I was preaching, and it was sort of like the phone call you got, are you sitting down? Uh, you mentioned in Sunday school, and the business manager told me, he said, we just got this gift. He said, what do you think we ought to do with it? Well, immediately I knew I had been praying. I was like, well, we owe about a million dollars, you know. I said, I think we just ought to put it on that. And there's nothing glorious about paying down debt, you know. It's just, it just doesn't seem very glamorous, but I couldn't deny it. I said, this is what we've been praying for, and... Uh, so then after that, it was like two or three weeks later, a Christian businessman called me. He said, hey, he said, I hear you're trying to get out of debt. I said, news travels fast. I mean, how many people ask you that question? And uh, I said, well, you're right. And he said, well, tell me about it. I said, well... We owe $933,000. We just got this gift. And I said, I just know the Lord wants us to put it towards that. And he said, so that means you have how much left? And I told him, and he said, all right. So he calls me back a few days later, and he says, I'll tell you what. This is like September now. He said, you know, he said, if you can raise $183,000 in two and a half months, he said, we'll give you the last $250,000 to pay off your indebtedness. You want to talk about mixed emotions? I mean, part of me was like, man, $250,000. And there was another part of me that said, 183 in two and a half months, and I don't like asking people for money? But it was one of those things where I was like, Lord... What am I going to do? Argue with him? And so I hung up the phone, and long story short, December 29th of that year, 
we got a check for $20,000 from somebody in Raleigh, North Carolina that I had never met before in my life. And that was the last $20,000. And we paid it off by the end of the year. Now, I tell you all that to tell you that soon after, I said, you know what, this is something I just never want to forget. I mean, God had just unfolded it in such a way. And I told uh, our faculty, I said, you know, I'd really like to do something. And his instrument was Brother Camp. I said, I'd like to get a huge rock. <laughs> I'd just like to get a huge rock and just put it down somewhere on our campus. And it's in our courtyard. And, and Brother Camp, if anybody can find a huge rock, it's Frank Camp. <laughs> and he was like, hey, I know I think where we can get it. He said, get it for free. I like that even better. And I'll never forget, the day came, we put this huge rock in our courtyard area, and it has a little bronze plaque, and it says from that scripture, hitherto hath the Lord helped us, the word Ebenezer. Now, I told you that story because I want to tell you something. You know what? There have been days where my heart has been broken and burdened for people. And the only thing I know to do is just take a step out to the courtyard and look at a big rock. And after I stare at it for a little bit and I think about what God did, I just go walk away in a lot better shape than when I came. And I can honestly say it's not $933,000 that moves me. But it's what God did. You know, I don't know what the years ahead hold for you, but I'll tell you what, just you mark it. When God does some major things, you make that stack. And I promise you, there'll be times you'll go back to it. You'll be reminded of what God did and you'll go forward in faith. I think anniversaries are great. And I don't think it's a bad idea to look at those stacks of stones in your life. And maybe you need to make some before you leave and say, you know what, I, I need to remember what God has done. Because one day your kids may say, what's that pile of rocks for? And you say, I'll tell you what, it's God's glory.